Alrighty, Kill Teamers, we are here for another re-review of the Mandrakes for Kill Team 24, Kill Team 3.0, whichever we're going to end up calling it. I'm Travis from Just Another Kill Team Podcast, and we've got a doozy of a Mandrakes re-review. With a change of many of the parts of the game, we're getting a whole shift over to some new abilities. We've still got Movement 7 along with what we assume is every single other Eldari team and maybe some of the other fast teams. We've seen already on Phobos with the reviews, so we're expecting that this is going to be a huge change of pace. Unfortunately for us, the Mandrakes don't have too many changes being at the tail end of Season 3. We've still got 9 operatives, we still are required to take 4 warriors, and unlike the other major teams in this edition warriors for us look exactly the same we've also lost some of our tricks in smoke being less powerful now that smoke is an obscurity trick and can be removed within two inches gone are the days where we can drop the shade weaver smoke in a bubble and leave and expect us to stay safe we're going to also have to play a little bit cagier without seek and destroy but because we have recon, we still get confirmed kill, so we might still be able to play a pretty killy plan compared to some of the other things. For any of our re new players trying to pick up Mandrakes with the changeover for, to kill Team 24, the Mandrakes have four very important abilities. We've got Within Shadow, the most important tagline of the team, then most of your abilities trigger in and around within shadow so to be within shadow you need to be within one inch of heavy terrain that's not higher than you you or you could be underneath a vantage or you could be within one inch of the shadow portal the shadow portal is created by our shade weaver and because of the move to physical tokens we actually have the ability for the shadow of the shadow portal to actually be a little bit bigger than we had in the last edition which is a nice little change what are the benefits you get for being within shadow? Well, every single Mandrake has a five up in Vuln save or ignores piercing save, depending on how you want to call it in this new edition. That is boosted to a four up if you are within shadow or close to a shadow portal underneath the vantage, any of the options will do. Additionally, you can shadow passage once a turn with any operative. Instead of doing a reposition, if you are within shadow, you can teleport a Mandrake away and place it somewhere else within shadow, out of engagement range, and not as a valid target from an opponent. So basically, you can have people blip out of existence into far, far away corners. Especially with the move to three operative or three objective zones on this game, that ability is probably going to be very useful. Lastly, we have the Soul Strike ability. Every single Mandrake hits on threes, which is decent and does 3-4 damage for the most part. That is boosted by the Soul Strike ability. Soul Strike is rolling against your opponent's APL with ones being a critical and twos and threes being normal saves. Luckily, there are a few ways for you to stun an opponent, especially on the Dirge Maw, which can mean that you're dropping your opponent's save by a full 16%. So... Your shooting is not amazing, but it always hits better than what your opponent is expecting. Just know that you're going to be really bummed out when your opponent rolls ones and you roll fours and fives. It is one of the weird ways that the team interacts with the base armor. Now, we're going to go talk about some of the cooler operatives on the team and just get a feel for what the highlights are of playing the Mandrakes. With the Mandrake Night Fiend, we've got... A little bit worse instead of hitting on three or instead of hitting on twos we now hit on threes similar to many other leaders of the edition losing some of our more powerful leader operatives across the board we still have the ability to stall opposing activations with harrowing whispers so launching a mandrake night fiend closer to your opponent's lines means that every time your opponent tries to activate a model we get to do a little roll off and if we win that model has to pass the Ublex still maintains the 5-up Shrug that happened in the last edition. Still very powerful, still hard to rely on because there's no real way to fudge that dice roll. Meanwhile, we get to the big boy of the team, the Chooser of the Flesh, one of the most important operatives. Because when he gets a melee kill or has someone die in a fallback, you get a Soul Harvest token. We really want to make sure that we can get a kill with the Chooser of Flesh in a game, and many games are decided on whether or not you actually get that first kill, because a 3 APL Mandrake means that you can Shadow Passage, take an objective, or do something else, and 
don't forget that you can heal with a Soul Harvest token. I know I buried the lead a little bit. Soul Harvest tokens are floating tokens that you get when the True Zero Flesh gets a kill. Whenever another Mandrake activates at any point during any any sequential activation, you can burn the Soul Harvest token and either turn that Mandrake into a 3 APL operative or heal him 2d3. Next up, we've got the Dirge Maw. What used to be a very powerful, annoying piece to mess with your opponent's lines has been changed a little bit. We've gotten a little bit toned down. Now our haunting focus requires us to actually interact with the target that we are touching before we can go touch someone else. So before, haunting focus meant that in a strategic gamut phase, you would pick an opponent and you would go before them. But you were not explicitly forced to attack them first now haunting focus does require you to do a fight or shoot action before you can use paradolic projection is the ability for you to injure someone anywhere on the board who is within shadow or you can target a valid target and make them injured until the beginning of the next activation now that haunting focus has been changed we do not have that ability Horrifying Scream has also been nerfed in a sense where it has Seek Light instead of Indirect, which means that on the heavy terrain of Volcus, many times Horrifying Scream is not going to be allow is not going to allow you to break any parity before you get shot. Luckily for us, it still does incur stun. So when you stun someone, you can get a lot of extra power off of this. Our Shade Weaver still remains an incredibly powerful support piece, letting us Shadow Portal here and remain as useful as ever. Shadow Portals do not fade away when the Mandrake leaves, so he bursts a hole through, re through reality that everyone else can use. Weave Darkness is still permanent, but it still is a little bit nerfed because Obscurity is different. Now that you can shoot through Obscurity, you cannot just put a Mandrake in a bubble and pretend like he's not going to get shot. Because opponents probably still should pour shots into you, and with that 4-up invul, that's probably not going to be quite enough. Meanwhile, the Mandrake Abyssal is our primary aggro support piece, either buffing our operatives to do more damage or nerfing opponents to deal less damage to us. He's got our best shooter and our buffer, He's got five attacks on threes, three, four, soul strike with either blast two or lethal five up. Remember that in condensed areas on Volca strongholds and on in the dark, our blast profile gains lethal five, making it generally better just on its face because you can now hit multiple targets. That's pretty much most of our operas because the next thing we have is our Mandrake Warriors. Those are unchanged from this edition. So let's hop on to the strategic poise. We will always need to be within shadow for any of our strategic ploys to work. So our first one, Creeping Horror, a movement cheat, allows us to take an out of phase dash whenever an opponent finishes one of their activations once each turn per operative that is concealed and within shadow. Very powerful, still allows you to get these long bomb charges off, but you do need to stay within shadow. As far as getting shot at, Glomming Shroud remains ever useful, letting you retain a save before getting shot. That means that if you are within shadow and getting shot, you're retaining a 4-up save and then rolling two 4-up invulns, or two 4-up saves that ignore piercing, sorry. Meanwhile, we can have Blades in the Dark. If we start and end within shadow, we can get a concealed charge. Very powerful, obviously the commandos have this as a team ability, so being able to option into this is nice. It's a little bit worse because in addition 221 we would actually use this on turn one to get some aggro where we wouldn't so maybe this won't see as much play but it's useful when it's useful and then as for reliability if we are within shadow we can re-roll any of our to hits with inescapable nightmare very powerful use it often and use it well because hitting on threes while good means that sometimes you only get two attacks and sometimes you actually want three as far as our firefight ploys nothing has really changed we still need some stuff to be within shadow and all of our ploys are useful when they're useful but not generically useful so slither out of sight lets us switch from engage to conceal at the end of an activation as long as we're within shadow soul feast lets us heal based on the number of attacks we deal very useful for getting our chooser of flesh or our night fiend out of trouble nowhere to hide allows us to ignore terrain for the purposes of movement this is actually one of our big gotchas on the team because suddenly you can ignore accessible the entire chunk of terrain and just 
phase in and out of existence to end up right where your opponent doesn't want you. I suspect with the three objectives of the new edition, this is going to be much spookier because now you can get where your opponent really isn't expecting. Shadow's Bite is our melee priority cheat. If you are within Shadow and someone finishes a charge and starts a fight, you can spend one CP for this firefight ploy to go first. Very powerful and remains powerful. As far as our equipment, some of the, our options have been changed with the new edition, but considering that we only have three objectives, maybe some of these nerfs aren't all that big. First off, most of them look about the same, but Chain Snare is now much improved in that every single operative gets the ability to maybe stuff a fallback on a 4-up. Two D6s when you're trying to stop someone with fewer wounds than you. So against the seven wound humans, you are substantially scarier than against the nine wounded up models. Shadow Glyph, our Super Conceal from the last edition, returns, but as a once a turn floating Super Conceal. This is both better and worse because you can't have it on multiple operatives, but considering there's only three objectives on the board at any given time, maybe this won't really feel like much of a nerf with the new changes. Soul, Bl Soul Gem allows you to have Blast once a turn. Don't forget that because Open Play or Volcus has condensed strongholds, this Blast 1 actually also reads Lethal 5 up. And Bone Darts, a solid, always silent profile, something that many teams have lost in this edition. To be fair, it is only a 6-inch range, so you're not going to be able to use it all that often. But the fact that everyone can be silent and you can just run around and throw 4 tacks on 3s, 2-4 rending silent profiles at the edges of your opponent's terrain is going to feel very annoying. We're expecting that Chain Snares, Bone Darts, and Shadow Glyphs see pretty regular usage, and Soul Gem is an option if you're playing against a Horde team, or if you feel like you need the extra punch of an extra lethal 5-up operative if there's multiple objectives inside of a Volcus Stronghold. Overall thoughts? Pretty sure that Mandrix will still be pretty solid. They've gotten a little bit worse. Elites have gotten better, so the fact that Elites are back and in business with a new Counteract phase does maybe bode not that great for Mandrix. Only time will tell. Luckily for us, we also get the new and improved counteract phase against the horde teams that Mandrakes used to suffer against. So Brood Brothers, Veteran, Death Corps of Krieg, Pathfinders, these teams all give us new counteract phases. So it might be that Mandrakes make it through the addition change just as strong as before. And that's about it for our re-review of the Kill Team 24 Mandrakes. Thanks for joining us with just another Kill Team podcast. We'll see you over at uh, Goonhammer and the podcast. Later!